Talking Bears once again here on Bears All Access on Chicago Sports Radio 670. The score, it's brought to you by IGS Energy. Good to have you along, along with Tom Thayer. I'm Jeff Joniak and Jim Miller from Sirius XM and FL Radio's Moving the Chains, our weekly guest. Thanks to our producers, Jordan Treadup, Dan Brilli, and the folks here at The Score. Coming up at the bottom of the hour, we're joined by veteran tight end Ryan Griffin. Boys, good to see you. Good to talk to you. Uh, this is the, uh, the downtime, it, it, as it is. Every year, the quiet time of year, but it's still not quiet, is it, Jim? No way, no how. No, I, it, you know, players, you know, they got to be smart. You know, this is when you got some free time, uh, some money in the bank, and you, you got to make some wise decisions. You know, this is, uh, I always bring it up that this was a, a point where I kind of cranked it up in terms of my training. You're expected to be in shape when you arrive to camp. Tra- a camp isn't some time that you, you're starting to get in shape. You've already built this foundation So for me, I want to crank it up. But, you know, again, time on your hands. Be careful. Just spend it with family and friends and no foolishness. I mean, the task at hand is just around the corner. And, Tom, uh, the league would love 24-7 NFL headlines, and uh, they still do. There's always something going on, something either inside the game or outside the game, and that's been the case again this week. And then, you know, you talk about the unveiling of the training camp schedule. That's another milestone. So fans are going to get 11 shots at seeing the Bears up at Hallis Hall. We all agree that it was a wonderful experience to have a home camp without having to pack everything up and go a lot more efficient. Fans are up close. Great opportunity. The first one they'll be able to see for themselves is July 28th. So we're a little more than a month away from that, but just to reflect on what training camp, and there's adjustments to it, and the Bears are going to tweak how, and the interactions with the players are going to be back with autographs and everything, just what it'll be like at Hallis Hall and the efficiency of it all. Well, you know, continue the familiarity that you've been able to build upon by bringing this whole rookie class into Hallis Hall. They know how to get there. They know how to get home. They know where their locker is. They know all the inner workings of the building that so no one's ever late for meetings or trying to transition from one area to the next and they know the distances in between. The one thing about it, I think, in this next six weeks, is everybody was up in arms when they asked Justin about, is he ready to play a game? And Justin said, no, I'm not ready. But I'll be ready in 10 weeks when it's, or however many weeks September 11th is. So when Jim talks about what you have to do during this next six weeks, yeah, it's time off from being required to be in the building every day, but it's not time off from your football responsibility. That's physically and mentally. So I think what Justin Fields can do with the information that he's been ba- able to put on the video and where he's going to go from and when they start up again, I think it can be as big as a building block as anything that he's faced since he was introduced to Matt Eberflus and this whole coaching staff in this offense. Uh, Tom, we got injury. So we knew that Dakota Dozier, the veteran offensive lineman, suffered a, a leg injury. Um in the minicamp and now had to be placed on injured reserve. He was getting first team reps at right guard. Uh, Does that impact you in any way at what the end result will be with that starter at that right guard position? Oh, significantly because it's rookies or a converted center trying to play right guard. To me, I hope that they still keep in the consideration that Lucas Patrick may be the best to play right guard if the rookies don't pan out or Sam Mustafer is better fit for center than he is offensive guard. you got to keep that an open mind when you're talking about developing five guys that can play alongside each other for the long haul. And Lucas Patrick has experience at right guard. Sam Mustafer does not have experience at right guard. So you got to keep an open mind, Jeff, when they bring these players aboard If you don't have a rookie that is really impressing you from day one, you may have to make some veteran moves to put the best offensive line out there. Or like I said, consider Tevin Jenkins. Here's a guy that if he can't play right or left tackle, can he play right guard? Jim, how do you feel about it? And are you okay with having a super young offensive line versus some veterans that are thrown in the mix? Well, I think it's it's going to be crucial for Justin Fields. He's got to know his blitz packages, and he's got to know his hots. So, you know, if a block is missed, he's got to get the ball out of his hands. So normally you like uh, with a, a, a young quarterback, you like a veteran offensive line, but that may not be the case here with the Bears. So I think it puts added pressure 
on Justin Fields to know the ins and outs of the pass protections, a uh, way to check plays, you know, to and from to put his, his offensive lineman in the best position. And as Tom mentioned, I mean, the, the real – you're going to find out how it really sorts out once the pads come on. Once the live bullets, when they go through blitz period and blitz pickup and inside run – it's going to sort itself out. It always does on the offensive line. But I do think it's going to be imperative if they do go young that it's going to put more pressure on Justin to really know where his blitz pickups are. And, and, at, some, and at some point, you know, they're, kind of, they're going to have to go with what they go with at the tackle position while keeping an eye, and they will because this is how it's going to be. Ryan Poles will be constantly having his guys look at seeing what's out there, who's still available, and if things aren't going in the right direction at some point in camp. So, Tom, for example, there's some tackles out there still available. Guys like Dwayne Brown, Eric Fisher, uh, and Riley Reef, two veterans that come to mind that have played the tackle position for a long time in the NFL. Uh, would that be an area that you'd be okay with if – you're not comfortable with what you're getting at the tackle position and the development of those young tackles at the moment. You know, Jeff, what did all three of us experience last year? 11 days, 10 days before camp, they bring in an 18-year vet who said he's been sitting on a, a, a lake shore fishing. So if you look at those players that you just mentioned, they do have experience. Will they take a responsible amount of money or are, because they know it's a desperation sign, are they looking to break the bank one more time? If that's the case, I don't want to bring in a guy that's money hungry. I want to bring in a player that's hungry. So, uh, yeah, the veterans are nice to mention Dwayne Brown. He's uh, been a heck of a player and he's had a heck of a career. But I'm going to exhaust every single guy that I have on this roster to tell me, okay, you cannot play then we got to look to make a change. Jim? One team that, that's out there that I think Brian Poles is very familiar with is Kansas City. They've got linemen to give. All right, they're going to have Orlando Brown's probably going to be the highest paid left tackle in the league. Joe Thune is the highest paid left guard. Creed Humphrey is an all pro as, as a rookie, as a center. Trey Smith started every game and playoffs as a right guard. And then you've got they've got penciled in Andrew Wiley at the right tackle. But Wiley is competing against uh, Lucas Niang, who they drafted a, a couple of years ago. They are loaded at their offensive line. So maybe there, a deal can be struck with Kansas City that have more than enough guys to give at both guard and tackle. Jim Miller, Jeff Joniak, Tom Thayer. We're going to take our first break. Coming up, we'll take a look at the defense of the Bears and the status of Robert Quinn. It's all ahead here on Bears All Access on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. Welcome back to Bears All Access, brought to you by IGS Energy. Choose clean energy for your home at IGS.com because every good choice adds up to a better world. With Jim Miller, Tom Thayer, Jeff Joniak, good to have you alongside as we break things down. We'll be back with you on Monday as well. So a quick turnaround. We'll jam as much as we can in to discuss the Bears of 2022. We'll start looking into the division as well. Take a trip around the NFC North to see what's going on with our friends in Minnesota, Detroit, and Green Bay. Fellas, uh, before the break, I said we're going to talk a little deep defense but you know the, the the elephant in the room really is Robert Quinn right now a veteran pass rusher who set a single season sack record for the Bears last year at an unbelievable bounce back year should have been a candidate as well for comeback player of the year in the NFL by far their uh, most consistent pass rusher on the team and he still has a lot of value to him missed the mini camp missed the entire offseason Jim where does that put him in your eyes and what he may or may not want to be. I mean, we don't have all the details of exactly what is going on or if he will be counted on for the Bears in 2022, and how does that impact the Bears moving forward? Yeah, I mean, certainly he's a veteran. His, his role is going to be his role. If he if he elects to report and shows up in shape, you know, he's going to be counted on, I, I think, to be a leader of the defense. And But – you know, from that standpoint, he's been in both a 4-3 and a 3-4. He's had production in both of those. He obviously is coming off a monster year and probably a little upset that he, that he in a defense that he had a lot of success in. They're going to change it up and do some different things. Um, so he has to be a professional about it. He may not be happy. Uh, he may ultimately not be with the Bears. I personally think he's a trading uh, chip. If some younger guys emerge, they're going to have an opportunity. And maybe they feel comfortable where the Bears can move on uh, from Robert Quinn. So I think it's 
there's a lot of things still up in the air, but hopefully he'll come in, be a professional about it, and and play as, as hard and be prepared to, to lead a team and bring a young defense along. But we'll see where it ends up. I think it's, it's open-ended. Uh, is where this could go. Tom, I'm torn on it personally because you never can have enough good players. Certainly in the front seven, you want to have rotating uh, bodies in there, have fresh waves and go at them, and the way they want to attack defenses, you know, this guy This guy is a turnover maker too. It's not just the sacks, it's the forced fumbles. Uh, where are you sitting on it? You know, I'm, I always think about Mike Ditka, ace, attitude, character, enthusiasm, and that's the approach I need in this locker room with the new coaching staff, with the young guys on this roster. We mentioned that he and Ryan Griffin are the only two guys with double-digit years of service. So I need him him to come in the locker room every day, go out to the practice field with a positive attitude that's going to carry over to Dominic Robinson, that's going to carry over to Travis Gibson and the rest of his defensive ends. That's the attitude I need him to have. And then if I'm looking at Robert Quinn, I'd be licking my chops to stay in this division. This is a group of left tackles that are there's so much uncertainty in this division that he could have another huge year just within the division. And then you talk about the other teams that are going to play around the league when you talk about the Jets and, and the Giants and teams like that. So, you know, Robert Quinn, it's all about attitude. If you come in here and you have a sour attitude from the first day you have to report, I think that really creates a negative vibe in the defensive preparation room, especially in the defensive line room. So I'm – Totally impressed what Robert Quinn did last year, and I hope he comes in with that same determination and that same attitude. All right, Tom, let's have some fun here because you just you just said something that kind of opened my. You said there's uncertainty at the tackle position in the division. So yeah. now, why do you say that? And I I trust you because you know offensive line so well. So in the division, you got Taylor Decker at left tackle in Detroit and Panay Sewell at right tackle. David Bakhtiari assuming Injured. he's healthy. He's got to be healthy but now, right? He's he recovered that I, year. No, there, that, there's, I was just reading a report. There's still uncertainty okay. about his health status. Elton Jenkins is a uh, assumed right tackle. He played left tackle. Christian Derisaw, the young tackle at Minnesota. Brian O'Neill, pretty good right tackle at Minnesota. So where where are you – how are you feeling about these why, – why do you feel this way, I guess? Because Kirk Cousins and Jared Goff are slow quarterbacks. They get out into their descent, and they're not the fastest of decision makers or, or on their feet. If you put pressure on Kirk Cousins, he's liable to throw an interception or just – you know, get in his own way. Same thing with Jared Goff. Aaron Rodgers, he's the best player in the division. But if you can disrupt his flow because of the other offensive linemen. So if Robert Quinn's here, they're going to have to focus their slide to, to the left so they can have multiple eyes on Robert Quinn. So that should open up the other pass rushers to the backside. And we've seen Robert Quinn being able to complement the rest of the defensive linemen. But to me, I still think that Robert Quinn is a better pass rusher than the talent at left tackle within our division. Jim, do you have any thoughts on uh, Tom's analysis there? No, I, you know, I think a lot of things got to sort itself out. You know, when you look at uh, Bakhtieri, you know, he was basically practicing all the way up to the end and then his knee blew up on him uh, again. So I'm, I'm with Tom. I don't think he's a hundred percent healthy yet. Yeah. They're going to say all the right things in the timetable that he'll be ready to go week one, but there's not a certainty in that. So he's already had a cleanup surgery and uh, for what I understand still really hasn't been on the field uh, for the green Bay Packers. I think Christian Darasaw is going to be a really good left tackle for Minnesota and Brian O'Neill's uh, pretty good. But uh, Darasaw is going on his second year. He was injured early, much like Tevin Jenkins. He had to get a core muscle surgery, so really didn't play. He got his feet wet last year, but didn't play top-tier football. But I do think he's going to be a solid tackle when it's all said and done. But Tom's right. You can take advantage of him because he's young. He's still a second-year tackle in the NFL. Uh, Taylor Decker, they were probably the, the Lions' strength, uh, to me, is their offensive line. And they ran the football and were committed to running the football a lot more. Penny Sewell's a stud. Taylor Decker's getting up there, and he came back from soldier, shoulder surgery uh, last year. But Detroit's new theme is running the football. They want more balance, and I think you just got to come in with those expectations. But uh, they're still 
young tackles, whether it's Derisaw, Penny Sewell, and if Bakhtieri's not in there, you're going against backups. So, but that's a savvy quarterback who can normally negotiate it up there in the Great White North. All right, now how does this <laughs> impact uh, Travis Gibson if Quinn moves on? Because he had seven sacks, five forced fumbles, and I think less than 500 snaps last year. So th- seemingly he's going to get more snaps, or maybe that, that rotation's good enough where they have enough depth to, to keep that in that same wheelhouse to keep him fresh. But pro football focus, Tom just named him a top five breakout player projection for 2022. Uh, likely because he's going to put his hand down, he's going to go get the quarterback. He doesn't have to drop into coverage like he used to and those sorts of things. So uh, there's a, a great expectation for Travis Gibson. That that's it, Jeff. There's great expectation for Travis Gibson. Mentally and physically, that puts a lot more pressure on you as a player. As we stood on the sidelines of training camp last year and we saw the improvement in Travis Gibson, you were going, Wow, I hope this relates to the field. And it did in the limited amount of snaps. Now if he's the bona fide starter and now the offensive coordinator, the offensive line coach, they devise a plan, a scheme of how to slow him down. It's a bigger challenge for Travis out of his stance week in and week out. And if he has to carry a load from a guy that just set a Chicago Bears sack record for one season, that's a tremendous amount of responsibility. So I everything that we hear from Travis, it's what you want to hear out of a guy that's climbing the veteran ladder. So hopefully he has another offseason of improvement like he showed and proved to us last year. He's going to, yeah, he's going to get opportunities. If Quinn is in camp and the opposite starter, he's going to get all the slides, as Tom mentioned. So Gibson's going to have opportunities, one-on-one opportunities, to get to the quarterback. This is a show-me league. You've got to see it to believe it. you got to show me. And I think the, the coaches – I uh, want him to show them as, long as, as well as his teammates. He'll get those opportunities, and as Tom mentioned, he's got to take advantage of those opportunities. To date, he has, but now he's going to be required to do it potentially down in and down out on a consistent basis, and we'll see if he can earn that. Jim Miller, Jeff Joniak, Tom Thayer here on Bears All Access. Let's take a break on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. This segment of Bears All Access is brought to you by Athletico Physical Therapy. Visit athletico.com to request an appointment in clinic or virtually and start feeling better tomorrow. Tom Thayer, Jim Miller, two former Chicago Bears. Jeff Joniak here getting excited about the start of training camp at the end of July. We'll see you out there, fans. No question about it. We got uh, also the fan uh, family fest. That is always a popular thing. Going to be 1035 in the morning on a Tuesday, I believe, at Soldier Field in oh. August. So that'll be exciting for the young folks to come out and watch the uh, new version of the Chicago Bears. So I've been racking my head to try to co- find a couple of guys that are kind of under the radar, not discussed a lot, but may have to make a much bigger impact than maybe people are counting on. And maybe maybe I'm off on, on these, but I'm going to throw a couple names at you. We'll start with Tommy uh, as we stick on the defensive side of the ball. He only signed a one-year contract. He was injured with an ankle injury, missed all of 2021. Nicholas Morrow is expected to be a starter. Where they put him exactly, he's worked out a lot at inside linebacker at the middle linebacker position now in the new defense. Uh, Could be the green dot guy and let Roquan run wild over there on the weak side. All yet to be determined, but would you count him among those uh, high expectation as well, despite signing a one-year contract here in this defense? Well, Jeff, you know, you just said something that kind of was an alert to me when we're talking about Nicholas Morrow and allowing a run a linebacker to run wild. Because as an offensive guard, if I was preparing to play against a linebacker that was six foot two twenty-five, I would be encouraged throughout the course of the week to run right at him and see if he can withstand the abuse of having three hundred and thirty pounders from three hundred pounders running at him or 265-pound tight ends. If Nicholas Morrow stays healthy in his lower body and he can run to the speed that he's capable of running, then I give him the advantage. If he ever has to take on blockers at the isolation plays with blasting game of fullback or, you know, fullbacks around the league, and then that's where I see the challenge is going to come from. But if you're going to get a team that's going to try to run sideline to sideline against the Bears, Morrow, Roquan Smith, I think they're two of the fastest, best interior linebackers within the division. 
It's going to be to see how teams are to determine to run at him. You think of the first regular season game of the year. Mm. And talking to some guys from San Francisco, they believe Trey Lance is going to be the starter. So what does that do to the game plan of the San Francisco 49ers? Is he going to be attacked with George Kittle? Is he going to be attacked by offensive linemen? So to me, it's how does this Nicholas Morrow disengage from being attacked or how is he able to run sideline to sideline when you talk about linebackers running free? Jimmy, he had a couple 70-plus tackle seasons there with the Raiders before uh, suffering that injury last year. So he was he was on the rise, and you can't, you can't replace the speed. I mean, he's born with the speed. Yeah. He's got speed. Yeah, I mean, and that's what uh, Matt Eberflus, uh, head coach of the Bears, has talked about. That, that's got to be the standard. Guys got to be able to run and fly to the football. And Morrill has that type of speed. And I, I think we all have seen it in, in Roquan Smith. That guy's a heat-seeking missile. You know, part of it is their instincts, uh, and they have to use their speed to their advantage, as, as Tom mentioned. Sometimes you're taking on a 300-pound, 320-pound offensive lineman. You got to be able to weed through the trash and sometimes beat those offensive linemen before they can even get to the second level. Some of it has to be with the the guys up front, guys like Kyrus Tonga that really need to keep those linebackers clean so they can fly and fill and do all the things that they need uh, to do. And some other times it'll just be with their uh, their keys, uh, their key and diagnosis, the recognition of a play where they're going to become unblockable just by getting to the spot where they believe the ball's going before the running back's able to, to get there, say a, on an outside zone play. So they'll beat it with a, a little bit of both, sheer speed. they got to be savvy to, to shed blocks and weed through the trash and then, of course, have to count on the guys up front to do their jobs as well to keep them as clean as possible. You know, just to clarify this, I'm not saying Nicholas Morrow cannot do it, Because one of the best linebackers I've ever played against in the history of the USFL and the NFL was Sam Mills. And so this guy was a multi-time all-pro, multi-time pro pro bowler. So I'm just saying if I was an offensive lineman and I was studying my opponent and I saw that, I would would have a great deal of confidence me personally running at him. All right, we're going to take another break. Coming up next, out of the break, we'll be joined by the Bears' new tight end, the 10-year veteran Ryan Griffin, who's helping out with a unit that is going to be counted on to do a lot of work, both in the pass and run game for the 2022 Bears. This is Bears All Access on Chicago Sports Radio 670, The Score. Get an up-close view of practice and your favorite Bears players at Hallis Hall. The 2022 training camp schedule is out. Go to ChicagoBears.com for more details. Welcome back to Bears All Access here on Chicago Sports Radio 670. The score, top there, Jeff Joniak, Jim Miller will be along in a while. And now joined by Bears tight end, Ryan Griffin, kind enough to join us on your time off in this moment after the mini camp and the start of training camp. Uh, You're an experienced guy, 10 years in. What do you do with this time? Have you adjusted it over the course of your career in any way from uh, when you first started where you're at right now? Oh, sure. Yeah, there's a, been a lot of growth, you know, during this time. As a rookie, I remember my first, you know, time off. We had the rookie symposium and got to travel out to Canton and, you know, meet some of the, the greats of all time and the bus and stuff. Uh, unfortunately, they don't do that anymore. I wish they would continue that. But uh, that being said, that was 10 years ago. Uh, Now, you know, my break consists of a lot more training. Uh, It's almost like uh, I used to treat this as kind of a break, whereas now I'm just kind of ramping up into training camp. So I don't want to come to camp out of shape. So this time um, I'm using, while away from the facility, It's more about getting my body ready for my 10th NFL season. Uh, And I'm sure this is a message you pass on to the younger guys. They they can't get it confused, right? Because they're younger. They feel, you know, indestructible as you once did. But uh, this camp sounds like it's going to be something special in terms of uh, getting on your heels and being on the hoof the entire time. Have you had a toughest camp in your career moment that you could share that, maybe you could pass on to the younger folks and what they might expect, because this sounds like it's going to be a tough one. Yeah, sure. I I would say always camps with first year head coaches um, are a little bit tougher. Uh, The urgency is there. Mm -hmm. A lot of young guys who are hungry 
really want to make a name for themselves in front of this new staff. Um, really looking forward to the competition coming in August. Uh, you know, that being said, uh, the toughest moment in camp for me was probably as a rookie uh, down in Houston. Uh, for those who don't know, I was drafted in 2013 by the Texans and Houston's camp are notoriously uh, sweltering hot and uh, heavy and, you know, while we do play inside, uh, we we did practice outside uh, out there in the in the Houston Heat. And uh, as a rookie, I was going up against the likes of you know JJ Watt and Brian Cushing, just legends of the game. And uh, that was no fun. But that being said, I I did improve a whole bunch in one month. Huh. Learned a lot, and uh, I I consider those camps the start of you know my career as the building blocks of my technique and just the, the culture that I came up with um, really has helped me improve, you know, individually. So I credit a lot of those practices to, you know, my skill now. Ryan, first of all, let me congratulate you on your 10 year career. Cause when you look at the roster of the bears, you look at two guys that have double digit years of service yourself and Robert Quinn. And that's one thing that always impresses me, the perseverance of no matter where you came from, you have the determination where we're taught we're interviewing in your 10th season. So I saw an interview with you at the podium. You talked about the building and the vision of the Chicago Bears. So now at the conclusion of OTAs and mandatory minicamp, is the building and the vision what you thought that attracted you to the Bears? Yeah, I'd say so. Full stop uh, coming in. Uh, you guys even alluded to it, you know, with this upcoming camp. It's going to be a tough one. Uh, we're going to be running a lot. We're going to be well-conditioned. We're going to be violent. Uh, all these things uh, was said to me when I sat down on my visit. So all these things I see are transitioning, coming to fruition here, leading up into camp. So I would expect nothing different during the season. You know, a lot of times – when we see a, a guy, an elder statement, a guy with experience, and they draft a guy or they have guys in this position, oh, it's not my job to coach or teach these guys. You're kind of in a unique position. You've been able to get over plenty of hurdles in your career, and you have some young guys in the tight end room. So do you take the experiences that you've lived with and kind of share them with a, a Cole Komet or even a guy in a different position that can benefit them or – are you are you a guy that kind of keeps to yourself and uh, you know you, it's not necessarily their responsibility or you just kind of keep to yourself? Yeah, I try to take that as uh, I'm just trying to be a great teammate for everyone on the Bears roster right now. So wh whatever, even in my position, not in my position, I'm just trying to help these guys out on the field, off the field. Um, I've just come to realize that, you know, time in this league is cut short all too often. So I want to make sure that every single one of my teammates has, you know, you can use me as a resource to fully realize the talent and the time and the opportunity that they're presented with, you know, in such a great organization with, with the Bears. So, um, that's not going to be me, you know, um, holding off any tips or anything and, I, I'm there for Cole or whoever in the tight end room or even in the offensive unit room. Coaches even can come to me if they have something they want to discuss with me. I'm, I'm an open book for sure, and I've seen a lot in my 10 years, but I'm also, you know, hugely willing to learn. And I know uh, as soon as you stop learning, you stop growing. So uh, I, I'm there to just help this team get to where we want to be, and I'm really looking forward to doing that. Ryan Griffin, our guest here on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. This is Bears All Access, and it's brought to you by IGS Energy with Tom Thayer, Jeff Joniak, Jim Miller will be along in just a moment as well. Uh, I have to laugh because Tom always has a little smirk when he brings that up because when Tom was a rookie, he played in the USF, the, the original USFL, played an entire season, playoffs, got on his motorcycle, went to training camp, double days with Mike Ditka. It was brutal in the heat in, Northern, in Wisconsin, and then... Yeah. Played a Super Bowl season. So he played, wow. what, 44 consecutive games, which yeah. is incredible. <clears throat> he really is. In one calendar year, he played. And we talk about it a lot, but 
I don't know how willing he would have been because this guy is an unbelievable competitor to this minute that he would be sharing tips for a guy to take his job. Right. I mean, you just, (laughs) it sounds almost foreign, Tommy, right? Yeah. Well, I, you know, for me, I, I mean, I learned pro, I learned more from a guy like Steve McMichael, who I was practicing against every day through his experiences, than I was at some of the fellow offensive linemen because we were competing against each other. But, you know, Ryan's in a different seat. You know, all the experiences through changing from organization to organization, philosophical thinking of different coaches, and now all that experience that he can – Add to, um, you know, these young tight ends or a young offensive tackles career. And guys, like, I truly, I love the game, right? So if it's if it's not going to be me, I would hope if somebody's out there at the tight end position, they would have all the tools available to make to make the play, to get the six technique blocked, to run the, the right route against a different de- defensive technique. So... I mean, at the end of the day, we're all on the same team. So uh, if Cole's out there, I'm not. I want him to be ready to make a play to, you know, to help us win. So I guess that's my mindset. And, and that's a good one. The modern day players, I mean, I've, I've heard of some horrible stories, and we're not going to belabor this point, but just, you know, guys were just thirsting for information and nobody would give it to them. And so they had to figure it out on their own, and it didn't benefit. It was not a tight team. Now, Tom's team was different. It was a super, <laughs> super – I mean, it's this 85 Bears. They were a personality all, all of its own. Now, you mentioned you love the game. Uh, New Hampshire born and bred, right? That's right. You, That's UConn, right. Guy, UConn guy. Uh, so you got that tough uh, northeast to you. Uh, how were you viewed coming out of the draft or coming into the draft – were you disappointed where you were selected? And have you ever taken the time to see how many guys are no longer playing at that position in the draft? Because that was the Kelsey draft. That was the Zach Ertz draft. 2013 was a, a pretty star-studded tight end class. Uh, sure. Yeah, I, I keep track of it uh, <laughs> daily, <Okay>. honestly. <laughs> yeah, um, so how yeah. many of you are left? Uh, like you said, uh, you know, Ertz is, is still there. Kelsey's doing his thing. Um Jack Doyle actually yeah. uh, just retired. You know, me and him, I used to compare only because he was a undrafted free agent and I might as well have been, you know, I was a <laughs> sixth round. I think I was 201 overall. So, um, yeah, you know, that's uh, that's a big chip on my sh- my shoulder that I that hasn't really left, to be honest. Uh, never got an invitation to the uh, combine, uh, which really hurt at the time when I was a rookie coming in um, and I was kind of a 50, 50, not sure whether I was going to get drafted or be an unsigned uh, or assigned uh, undrafted free agent. So uh, I try to keep that with me. Uh, like I said, it's just a big chip on, on my shoulder and I try to carry that, um, that fire with me that, it, you know, some people still doubt me. And uh, a lot of those guys that were drafted over me are no longer in the league league. So, I'm just trying to do my thing and, uh, you know, help out the, the team along the way as well. Ryan, you know, I, I find it interesting because back when I was playing, you know, we had the last game of the season, we had our exit physical, and we never had to show up until the mandatory minicamp. So now you guys, when Matt Eberflus got introduced as a head coach and he said these guys better have their running shoes, it kind of gave me an indication that you better be in shape or else. When you lost an OTA practice, after all the OTAs you've been through throughout your career, were you surprised you lost one? Because when I was out there watching and I was looking at the tempo you guys were playing at, I was thinking it's beneficial for the young guys to get a more realistic feel of the speed of the game. Were you surprised when you guys got docked an OTA? I don't know if I was surprised. Uh like like you, I think uh, it was detrimental to our team, however, uh, us losing an opportunity uh, to get better. You know, you only get, what, I think 14 of them. And, uh, you know, w- with the new staff and new offense, especially, um, you know, on the offensive side of the ball, I think we really lost an opportunity there to – to get better and improve. Um, was I surprised? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think after – uh, this pandemic situation, having OTAs canceled uh, for a whole year, a lot of guys got to, 
you know, look, look back on that and say, you know, we are here voluntarily and, uh, you know, for the tempo to be, you know, a little bit higher and guys, um, you know, hitting without pads on, uh, you know, guys are just looking at it different. You know, it's a different NFL today. And, uh, you know, I've been a part of OTAs that have gone much harder than what we did, you know, last month. But that being said, it is, it's a different league. And, uh, you know, the PA is really trying to cut down on off-season injuries. Unfortunately, we had Dakota, you know, go down. Um, but uh, it is part of the game. Uh, we're just trying to make it safer for everybody. You know, I forgive me if I'm asking – uh, if I'm so wrong in my time frame, did you ever play with Jeff Scanina? Because it's kind of funny that he was down with the Houston Texans. He's the uncle of Cole Komet. And I was thinking, wow, what a generation gap filler you would be if you were one time a teammate with Scanina and now you're p- playing with his nephew, Cole. I think I just missed out playing with <laughs> Jeff. Uh, I came in in, in 13, but uh, yeah, it's uh it's great to play with uh, with Cole, um, someone who, you know, hometown kid and, you know, his dad obviously, you know, played for, for the Bears. So uh, really excited for him, for the opportunity that he has. Um, and, yeah, it's it's kind of funny. Uh, you know, I'm 32. He's, what, 23 now. And, you know, I, I just try to give him, you know, as much uh, knowledge of the game, you know, as I can and help him out. Our remaining moments with Bears tight end Ryan Griffin here on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score with Tom, I'm Jeff. All right, let's uh, final moments. Just talk about the team because what seed, in your opinion, has been planted by this head coach, Matt Eberflus, in his first go around? I would say toughness. If I had to boil it down to one, it's going to be mental toughness. And, uh, you know, like you said, we're going to have the track shoes on. So we're going to be a uh, better conditioned than our opponent. And at the end of the day, we're going to have to make plays when it, when the time gets tough, you know, at the end of the, at the end of the game. And we're certainly going to be in shape to do so. It's if we have the mental fortitude and the uh, preparedness to uh, execute, you know, in the fourth quarter, because our, our bodies are going to be there. Our lungs are going to be there. That's for sure. Coach Eberflus is going to make sure that happens. So uh, we're going to have the toughness. You know, it's it's going to come down to can we execute? Can we beat the man across from us? Uh, can we win eleven individual matchups on the same play? You know, so I'm I'm really looking forward to it. I think uh, we have the guys to do it in the locker room. We just got to you know put the work in and and looking forward to week one. This has been a team that has been challenged to score touchdowns even while winning over the years of late. So touchdowns you, you got to have. Uh, this un- it's underrated offense, I'm certain, from the outside looking in about what is put- being put together. As a veteran who's seen a lot of camps, a lot of players, 20 other quarterbacks in his career, now 21, do you have a good feel for what this might look like for the 2022 Bears for the fans going to Soldier Field this year? You know what? I'm so excited <laughs> to see what Justin Fields can bring to the offense. I don't think... Um, like you said, we're we're going to be underrated, and that's fine. That's okay with us. Nobody uh, is really expecting us to do much, but uh, I think a lot of people will be surprised. Um, like I said, if we put the work in uh, in August, we do have the skill at skill positions to make some waves and score some score some points. Uh, we're going to be excited to watch uh, Coach Eberflus's defense out there make plays and. You know, I, I again, I cannot wait for number one to get out there and let it loose. You know, Ryan, I think in the last 10 years in the NFL, the tight end position has changed more than any other position in the NFL. When you're at the front side point of attack, when you're the back side, when you're an H back in motion or you're at the full back position. Now they said, OK, this is going to be an outside zone running team. In your career, how much have you been a point of attack tight end as opposed to backside H back or full back? You know, it's funny you said that, Tom, because I was actually drafted, like I said, down in Houston uh, with Coach Kubiak, um, and he was running a similar system, the the wide zone scheme uh, with the tight end, the Y at the point of attack in the front side. And even, honestly, on some of the backside runs when we go wide zone uh, to support, uh, the backside ends up being the front side. So um, that being said, the tight end position is very important in terms of the run game uh, here. So 
Uh, my experience, I started here in, in 13. This was my role coming in as a rookie. I was there to be a, the point of attack to help Owen Daniels, you know, do his thing as the you back, the F, the move guy. Um, and this was my role. So it, it kind of comes full circle. I played every position <laughs> since then. You know, that the fullback guy, the move guy, I've been, you know, uh, split out sometimes. And now here I am back at the, the uh, what you want to call the, the Y spot, you know, the move tight end, you know, at the, at the front side of the run. So uh, I'm looking forward to getting back to it, uh, you know, bring some toughness and violence to this, uh, to this offensive line and uh, really looking forward to running the ball this year. Ah. Awesome. Music to our ears. Trust me. Yep. Yeah. Music to our ears. We love hearing the yeah. violence. We love hearing the running game. All right. Awesome. We really appreciate yeah. your time. Thank you so much for joining us. We're looking forward to uh, watching your work and uh, help lead this team. And looking forward to talk to you down the road again. Appreciate it. Yeah, same guys. Thanks, Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you, on. Ryan. That's Ryan Thanks, Griffin, Bears tight end. When we come back, we'll wrap up the show with Sirius XM NFL Radio's Jim Miller with Tom Thayer. I'm Jeff Joniak on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. This segment of Bears All Access is brought to you by CDW, people who get it, with Tom Thayer and Jim Miller, Jeff Joniak, as we break down the Bears of 2022. We'll be back with you on Monday night as well. Uh, Tom will be on assignment, and be big Jim Miller and I taking the controls. Jim, are you ready for just a, a duo show without the big guy? No time to get scared now, Jeff. I'll be ready. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, so uh, great listening to Ryan Griffin, great personality, uh, and he hit it on the head. He plays violent, wants to play violent. The Bears want to play violent. Uh, but I was really encouraged to hear how that tight end position is going to be used, Tommy. Uh, and it's it's fitting that this week is tight end school, right? Or what do they call it? The, tight end you. Tight end you. Uh, so there's 28 guys, including Cole Komet, to uh, participate. Jim's got a big smile on his face. Why are you laughing? I know how Tom feels. Tom said if there was a guard camp, he wouldn't go. Yeah, well, I mean, I talked to George Kittle. I mean, probably in honor of Rob Gronkowski uh, oh, yeah. retiring. I mean, I believe it was George Kittle last year said it was just hilarious. The guy wakes up uh, and they saw him at the at the bar having a shot of vodka before they go out for a round of golf. So <laughs> I wonder what, what it's going to be like this year with Rob retiring. So God forbid, that's going to be a blast out there. Somebody's going to have to take the baton, right? No, no question about it. But, you know, Tom, dominant tight end play can really affect and impact what a defense has to do, put you in conflict. So if these guys can do both, catch and block, of course, and the different personnel packages, I mean, you're, you're talking about creating mismatches for success. No matter where your offense is at in terms of its development, and we are not going to know where this offense is at in its development until – Pretty far along, I would think, in the in the regular season. So I, I I'm I'm anxious to see how these tight ends and blasting game, as that fullback H back contributes, and what this will look like with with the new additions at the tight end position, veterans and Cole Komet. Well, you know, Jeff, the two points of emphasis that I got from OTAs: if it doesn't happen, the Bears are going to have a hard time improving. And if they're going to run the outside zone as much as they're talking about, the tight end is going to be instrumental in the success of that play because you're not always going to run it to the weak side where there's no tight end. You're going to run it a lot of the times to the wide side of the field, to the tight end in the three-point stance or a tight end coming from over the H block, blocking the end man line of scrimmage up to the second level. So you have to have a high-performing, high-blocking tight end, kind of a Mark Bravaro-ish or a George Kittle-ish. That's the type of performance you have to have on a tight end. But, Jeff, let's not let the topic escape us before the season gets going. The red zone. If these tight ends don't accomplish some big numbers in the red zone, it's going to be difficult for Justin Fields and the rest of this offense. So, to me, that the instrumental outside zone tight end blocking in the red zone performance by the tight end are the two biggest obstacles that we're going to have to see improve throughout the preseason and into the regular season. You know, the, the key is, like what Tom said, if you want to run that outside zone play, the tight end, if it is to his side, he's going to be the key player at the point of attack. As Tom mentioned, say there's a wide nine technique. Well, that's not a, going to be an ability for Cole Komet to, to get a hook block, right? He's going to have to really sustain it and string it out and be able to, uh, to be able to muscle it and hold it for a long time where the running back can get his read, whether he still will take it outside 
or whether it'll take it inside. If it's, say, a seven technique, the end man's on the on the end man line of scrimmage is kicked down over the, the, the tight end or just shaded just outside, now you'll have the ability to hook them where it'll be an easy read for the running back to just take it to the outside. So Cole's going to be able to, to do all that, and all the tight ends are going to be able to dictate it. At some point, they are going to be really the key player at the point of attack to really set up that run play that the Bears want to make a foundation of their offense. All right. And that out, listen, that outside zone play at home, it's going to be different than on the road because, as Jim mentioned, the tight end's not going to be able to hear the snap count. So he's going to have to have timing in his block. At home, it's a different story. All right, throw a name at you. I mentioned Nick Morrow. Earlier in the program, as a guy that the Bears going to need to have counted on for that position, but I'm going to throw one on the offensive side of the ball that maybe is under the radar. Uh, does he have the skill? He does have the speed, and he has experience in the system. We haven't talked a lot about Equiminius St. Brown. We talked about Byron Pringle, obviously Darnell Mooney, and we got Velas Jones. What are, you, what are your expectations for Equiminius St. Brown, is there untapped potential here, Jim Miller? And that'll wrap up the program tonight. Yeah, you know, you, you just you look at his time at Notre Dame, and he was a true X. You know, they've had some good X receivers coming out of there. You know, Miles Boykin kind of has been a, a a failure, but Chase Claypool has certainly been a solid X, I think, for the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I want to see Equiminius St. Brown really emerge. I think that's his role. He's a big guy. He can be a red zone presence, 6'5", 214 pounds. You know, he can be a jump ball guy where Justin Fields has to have the confidence that any 50-50 ball, he's got to feel comfortable throwing it up there uh, for St. Brown to, to come down with it. And he's had limited opportunities. You know, you look at, uh, you know, Aaron Rodgers, he kind of, it was kind of a fast break with him and De- Devontae Adams. And really the, the ball wasn't shared to a lot of players. It was kind of Randall Cobb. At the time, Tanyan stepped up a little bit. And, of course, Adams, those other guys, whether it's Valdez Scantling, who's now at Kansas City, or even St. Brown, really haven't had a lot of opportunities uh, because Rodgers clearly was favoring those other targets over St. Brown. He's got the size. He's got the skill. We'll see if he can take advantage of the opportunity that he could be the true X for the Bears this year. Tom, give me 15 seconds on the topic. Hey, if he plays up to a size and he develops a bigger catching radius, I think he can be a real asset for Justin Fields. If you're six five, you got to play like you're six seven. All right, with Tom Thayer, Jim Miller. Thanks everybody for listening. Thanks as always to the folks at the score, our producer Jordan Treadup, Dan Barilli, and our guest Ryan Griffin. That'll do it for us. Have a great night, everybody. This has been Bears All Access, brought to you by IGS Energy on Chicago Sports Radio six seventy. The Score. Good night, everybody.